Creator Creators is a study of creative icons who push the boundaries of art and whose influence can still be felt today. So take a seat, class is in session. Today we're talking the king of comics, Jack Kirby. Welcome class, I'm comic book girl 19, let's get started. Pop quiz, who created the majority of the core of Marvel superheroes dominating the box office, the toy store, and of course the comic book shops? Duh, everyone knows it was Stan Lee. Stan Lee created every comic book character. No robot, if you said Stan the man Lee, you're only half right or maybe a quarter, it's very debatable. Like Steve Wozniak to Apple's Steve Jobs, Jack Kirby made massive contributions to the Marvel Universe. The late creative giant set the bar for modern superheroes in both style and tone. Jack Kirby was instrumental in the creation of the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, the Avengers, including Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, Black Panther, and the list doesn't end there. Doctor Doom, Magneto, Galactus, Nick Fury, Silver Surfer, the Inhumans, and even the cover of Spider-Man's first appearance in Amazing Fantasy 15. It's all from the hand of Jack Kirby. Now there are lots of arguments out there that Jack Kirby created all of his Marvel superheroes single-handedly, but we're not gonna wade into all that because it's a lot of he said, she said sort of nonsense, and I'm also not here to take any shots at Stan Lee. He is amazing, Stan Lee's wonderful, and without him we would not have the Marvel we have today. But too often, the Stan Lee spotlight has left Jack Kirby in the shadows, and that just isn't right. If Jack Kirby is so good, then how come he's not making movie cameos like Stan Lee, huh? Well, one reason might be the fact that he died in 1994, before Marvel Studios got off the ground. But even if he was still alive today, he was such a workaholic that I doubt he would take the time to go on set to do that sort of stuff. This guy was an incredible workhorse. But he did have one cameo appearance in an episode of 1979's The Incredible Hulk on TV, and the contrast between Stan and Man Lee's overflowing IMDb credits and Jack Kirby's dialogue free bit as a police sketch artist is about as symbolic as it gets. Not even close with that description. Stan Lee may have the X factor, but flashiness is not proportionate to relevance. As editor at Marvel, Stan Lee is often credited with coming up with what's called the Marvel Method. By many accounts, this means that Stan Lee would give Jack Kirby like a half a page describing what he thinks should happen in the issue. Then Jack Kirby would make all of the creative decisions and make it happen in 14 hour days. This guy was churning out page after page of groundbreaking visuals and urgent relatable storytelling. Kirby's work is literally the stuff of legend. And at one point it was rumored he was turning in 75 pages a month. Is that a lot? 75 pages a month, are you kidding me? Most people do like 22 pages in a month, okay? That's like the average artist today. I bet I could do that. And the life of a comic book artist is anything but glamorous. To do this job, you have got to be personally passionate about it, which is what Jack Kirby was. He was a no-nonsense guy who spent most of his time in his home, hunched over a cramped little drawing board in a cramped little room while he was channeling these huge ideas onto the page. Why is Jack Kirby known as such a good artist? I mean, it looks pretty good, I guess, but it's not really as good as my drawings. <laughs> Shut up, everybody. <laughs> Jack Kirby is so influential because before Jack Kirby, comics art was very much posed, okay? You didn't have a lot of action, a lot of foreshortening and things like that. There was not the power and the excitement. But when this guy came along, he changed everything. The way he drew his characters completely changed an entire industry and it influenced generations of artists. He made comic books what they are today with the amazing action that he was able to draw. Yeah, I guess Kirby's art's pretty good. I guess, but have you seen my fish monster? Sure, that's a pretty good fish monster, robot. All right, class, now let's take a moment to talk about Kirby's personal history. He was born Jacob Kurtzberg on August 28th, 1917, and he is the son of Austrian Jewish immigrants growing up on Manhattan's notorious Lower East Side, living in a tenement building. He was the hard scrabble kid of a garment factory worker father, and he took to drawing and imagination as a means of escape from his often bleak surroundings that were filled with street gangs and fist fights and working class poverty. 
And this guy is completely self-taught and self-starting. He was knocking on doors of would-be employers, and by 18, he was working on Betty Boop and Popeye under Max Fleischer. Later, Kirby met his pal Joe Simon, and together they invented the Hitler-punching super soldier Captain America at Marvel's predecessor Timely Comics before the pair themselves were drafted to fight in World War II. Now, Kirby's commander, hearing that Kirby was amazing with a pencil, decided to give him the position of scout, which was super dangerous. He would have to go into towns, do recon missions, and come back with hand-drawn maps. And if you were caught doing that, you were dead! But he didn't die, and he totally got away with it. Wow, so Kirby was kind of like a badass. Kirby was a total badass. You're absolutely right, Space Brain. You get a star. Oh, yay! Simon and Kirby had had a brief stint at DC before the war and returned there afterward with Kirby working on Green Arrow with writers Dick and Dave Wood, the same guys with whom he launched the Challengers of the Unknown, a team of four heroes who squabbled and joked while saving the world. Later, he went back to Timely, now called Atlas, where he churned out fantasy, westerns, romance, and monster comics. Atlas later became Marvel, where under editor Stan Lee, Kirby repurposed the basic idea of Challengers of the Unknown into another quartet called the Fantastic Four, arguably one of Kirby's favorite creations. Ooh, teacher, is it true that the character of Ben Grimm, the Thing, is supposed to actually be based on Jack Kirby's real personality? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Kirby was a gruff brawler with a heart of gold just like the Thing, and he even did an interview with the Comics Journal where he said, I suppose I must be a lot like Ben Grimm. I never duck out of a fight, I don't care what the hell the odds are, and I'm rough at times, but I try to be a decent guy all the time. The Fantastic Four combined Kirby's understanding of the mean streets of New York and his love of the cosmos. He also loved history and mythology, which led to the introduction of Thor and Loki into the Marvel Universe. The Hulk wasn't far behind. Then came the Avengers, which allowed him to bring back Captain America. And then, of course, my personal favorite, the X-Men. Teacher, don't forget to address the important detail of how Jack Kirby got taken advantage of by Marvel and DC. All right, you're getting ahead of me, Space Brain. Calm it down in just a minute. But it's totally true, you are right, Jack Kirby did get screwed over by both Marvel and DC. And thanks to his story, creator's rights are a much more well-known issue in comics, giving rise to creator-controlled brands like Image Comics and better deals and working conditions at the big publishers. Well, he's famous. How did he get screwed then, really? Well, this goes back all the way to the 1930s. You had really terrible working conditions for artists and writers at these publishers. What would go on is that the publisher would give you a one-time fee or a small weekly salary, and then you would give them your ideas and they would own those ideas. So say if you had a big idea like Captain America and it blew up and became this huge thing, you wouldn't get any money for any of the toys or clothes or games or movies or TV shows or anything. The publishers kept it all. Despite the increasing success of Marvel in the 60s and the way his artwork in particular and characters were changing the entire industry, Kirby became frustrated by the setup of the business and left. He left, where'd he go? He went to DC, but we'll get into that in just a minute. As he later recounted, the artist is the lowest form of life on the rung of the ladder. The businessmen have absolutely no interest in artists. But the fact is that very young people were the ones who did the work and enabled these guys to continue the kind of lives they liked. All these businessmen were at the top of the pyramid, but the entire pyramid is resting on two little stones, and the pyramid denies the existence of these little stones because it's so big. Well, was it better when you went to DC? Not really, not at all. But anyways, he went over to DC, and there he created the fourth world and the new gods, the property that many consider to be his magnum opus, and in my opinion, heavily inspired Star Wars. Heavily, heavily. Kirby was able to spread his creative wings freed of the breakneck production pace of the old days. He introduced his new gods in Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, purposefully choosing Low Selling Monthly as his playground. The new gods' stories are like sci-fi Shakespeare. <gasps> Ooh, I love Shakespeare. Great, read some new gods then. And they were figures that had never before been used in comics. They were above mythic figures. And of course, they were the first gods. And I began thinking along those lines. The new gods evolved from those lines. And I began to ask myself, 
Everybody else had their gods. What are ours? What is the shape of our society in the form of myth and legend? Who are our gods? Who are our evil gods? And who are our good ones? And I tried to resolve them in the new gods. And I came up with some very, very interesting characters and very good sales, which satisfied me immensely. I had a nice sale. Later, Kirby leaves DC after being treated about the same as he was treated at Marvel to go back to Marvel, and there he gave us the Eternals. Now, he didn't only work in comics, he also dabbled in film and television and animation, and even worked on the look of TV's Thundar the Barbarian. Teacher, did you know that Jack Kirby also did a lot of collages? Yeah, I did, I'm the teacher. <laughs> in the 80s, Kirby sued to get some of his original pages back from Marvel. Frank Miller, Alan Moore, and Neil Adams totally had his back. They fought the man and they won the lawsuit. Now it is standard practice for artists to get their pages back, which they can later sell to collectors. So things are better now? Things are better now. Creator published titles such as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Cerebus, and the founding of Image Comics were all game changers inspired by the struggles of guys like Jack Kirby. And both Marvel and DC have gotten behind creator-owned imprints and series since then, like DC's Vertigo. Oh good, because I don't want anyone ripping off my fish monster here. I'm keeping all the rights for this baby. You're gonna make a ton of money. Going to the bank. Comic books is a collaborative medium. Had I not worked with artists, like Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, John Romita, John Buscema, Gil Kane, and all the rest of them. My stories wouldn't have looked as good. It was a total collaborative affair. And sometimes I feel a little guilty. You know, stand at this, stand at that. I did, but I did it with them. And they really deserve as much credit as I can ever get. And I just had to mention that. Yeah. And thank you. Jack Kirby passed away at the age of 76 in 1994, the same year as his longtime collaborator and wife of 42 years, Roz. Apparently she made sandwiches for everybody and was super awesome. They also had four children together, and Kirby's work lives on today, inspiring generations of artists, and you can see his characters in some of the biggest blockbusters of all time. Okay class, now it's time for your homework assignment. Be sure to check out Kirby, King of Comics Biography, and also Jack Kirby's New Gods Artist Edition and the Fantastic Four and Fourth World Omnibuses. Join us next time on Greater Creators where we're going to discuss the works of other amazing creators who influenced generations. Class dismissed. The source, like everything else, is an everyday fact. The source lives with us day by day. We don't know what the source is, where it is. We can't identify its form. But we know it's there. This thing, this tremendous thing, governs our lives. And somehow, we can all feel it inside. It's referred to as the spiritual. It's referred to in many other ways. But we know instinctively that it's there. And that's what I put down in, it, in my stories. Because, like everybody else, I felt this thing. I felt this thing, and I felt that it was real, and I've kept it with me all my life. Now, I didn't resolve the questions. I'm a guy who lives with a lot of questions. I say, what's out there? And I try to resolve that, and I never can. I don't think anybody can. Who's got the answers? 
I sure would like to hear the ultimate one, but I haven't yet, and so I live with a lot of questions, and I find that entertaining, I find that entertaining, and uh, if my life were to win tomorrow, it would be fulfilled in that manner, I would say, the questions have been terrific. Terrific. 